The substance, polyoxybenzylmethylenglycolin hydride, more commonly known as bakelite, thank God, was an early type of plastic, the first completely synthetic plastic, in fact. Leo Bakeland, the inventor of bakelite, was an already wealthy man who had made his fortune by inventing a type of photopaper called Velox, which is Latin for swift or rapid, and which was the first photopaper that could be developed under artificial light. He created Velox in 1893 and later sold the technique to Kodak. About a decade and a half later, in 1907, he came up with Bakelite while messing around in his home laboratory seeing if he could figure out an artificial replacement for shellac, a resin used as a colorant, a food glaze, and perhaps most commonly as a wood finish. Shellac was useful as a sealant, a varnish, and at blocking odors. It could even be applied to electronics to keep moisture away from sensitive components and for insulating wires. But shellac was derived from the secretions of the female lac bug, an insect found only in the forests of India and Thailand. The secretions are then dried into flakes, and those flakes are dissolved in ethanol to make marketable, usable shellac. Needless to say, there was a business opportunity here for someone who could create a useful resin that would replace this popular, bug-derived, and therefore limited in scalability, product. Bakeland realized that the lac bug's resin was a polymer, meaning it was a molecule composed of many smaller molecules, or monomers, usually of the same type. So you could have a molecule composed of a bajillion little amino acids, and the result would be a protein molecule. Or you could shove a bunch of ethylene molecules together and get polyethylene, a substance we'll be talking about more a little bit later in the episode. In the case of Bakelite, Bakeland combined phenol, also known as carbolic acid, and formaldehyde, the organic compound some listeners might know about and remember the smell of if they've ever had to dissect an animal in biology class. The result of this combination was a substance that could work in a similar fashion to shellac in that it had useful glazing and insulating properties, but it could also be used to produce casings for electrical products kitchenware and jewelry and guns and pipe stems and toys and numerous other consumer goods. The polymer proved to be incredibly useful for a wide array of purposes. And in 1993, Bakelite was designated a historic chemical landmark, putting it in the same category, at least according to the chemistry world, as the discovery of oxygen the development of the Howdry process for cracking crude petroleum into usable gasoline, and the discovery and subsequent large-scale production of penicillin. It should be noted that plasticity, the term from which plastics as a category of substance drive their name, is a standard property of materials that designates how far they can deform without breaking. Plastics are named as they are because of their immense plasticity to the degree that you can make almost anything out of them, and by using certain processes, often utilizing high levels of heat, but in some cases instead utilizing chemical catalysts, you can then harden them into a new shape that they then will hold until they are heated up or otherwise made malleable once more. They'll remain plastic in the sense that they will be more likely to warp than break, but they'll also have utility as solid objects. This means that the same substance used to create the structural layer of a compact disc or a DVD is essentially the same as what is used to create milk bottles and pill canisters and Ziploc sandwich bags and the casing on your Bluetooth speaker and the insulation on the electrical cord for your lamp and countless other things that surround us every day. But despite that ubiquity, with plastics found in just about everything, in developed countries about a third of all plastic produced is used in packaging. Another third is used for construction purposes, for pipes and plumbing and insulation for wires and vinyl siding. And only that final third goes into everything else, 
including things like cars, each of which, on average, is about 20% plastic. So we see a lot of plastic, but there's so much more of it out there that we don't see or consciously recognize as being the same, as being made of plastic. There are natural plastics. Shellac is one, as is chicle, which is a substance that is derived from the sap of trees in Mesoamerica and forms the base for chewing gum. Latex derived from rubber trees, also in Mesoamerica, is another. Both it and chicle have long been used by residents of the area. Chicle for chewing and latex for making balls for playing sports, making accessories to wear and for making figurines for decorative and religious purposes. But most of the plastics that surround us today are synthetic, meaning they're made artificially by slamming strings of small molecules together to get larger molecules with properties that we desire. And although there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 35 standard plastics regularly used in the products and industrial processes that make up a significant chunk of the physical manifestation of the modern world, one type of plastic in particular tends to be most frequently at the center of public discourse, primarily because of a single use case that has made it so ever-present, and ever-present everywhere, not just in places where it's supposed to be, where it's actually used, but also in places where it very much should not be. Today, we're going to talk about polyethylene, plastic bags, and the case for and against everlasting consumer products. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is a listener-supported independent show, which means it is brought to you by you. If you're enjoying what you hear, there are many different ways you can help support it. You can do so monetarily via PayPal or Venmo. If you go to letsknowthings.com slash contribute, you can find more information about that. You can also support the show via Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash letsknowthings, you can purchase one of my books, which you can find a list of at colin.io. And you can also help support the show by leaving a review up on iTunes. You can share the show with a friend. You can share it on your social network of choice on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Each and every contribution of any kind is very much appreciated. Thank you so very much. Your support is what makes this show possible. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors. Everlane is my favorite clothing company. Probably three-fourths of my wardrobe is made up of Everlane garments. They don't slap logos and everything. Their clothing is well made. They cut out the middleman in terms of their marketing budget, so you get really high-quality clothes for very reasonable prices. And if you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, that will take you to the Everlane page, and any purchase that you make while there, I will receive a commission for that as like a finder's fee. I would never encourage you to buy anything that you don't need. That would be silly. But if you do currently have a gap in your wardrobe that you've been meaning to fill, this would be a great way to kill two birds with one stone, to get a wonderful new item of clothing while also helping to support this show. Let's know things.com slash Everlane. And the other sponsor today is HostGator, the hosting company that I have been very gladly using for many years. If you go to HostGator.com slash LKT, you will receive a substantial discount off of their already very reasonable prices that they offer to listeners of this show. And that applies to plans both large and small. HostGator.com slash LKT. All right, let's get back to the show. The article that I want to start from today comes from the LA Times, and it's actually an editorial, not a straight-up news article. So keep that in mind if you do end up giving it a read. It definitely has a point of view. But that point of view, I think, is quite useful for the purposes of breaking into this topic. And that editorial is entitled, Stop Banning Plastic Bag Bans. And this article is from January of this year, of 2017. And it addresses a ban that went into full effect in California in 2016, which outlawed the use of single-use plastic bags in stores within the state. 
Now that said, a lot has happened between January of 2017 and when I am recording this episode, which is August of 2017. So many months worth of legal wheeling and dealing has occurred in the meantime, especially in places like Texas, where 16 cities have plastic bag bans similar to the one that California has. They have those in place as well. But where at the same time, the Supreme Court of Texas has been asked by the state attorney general to uphold a one-off lower court decision to ban plastic bag bans in Texas. And this request came a month after Senate Bill 103 died in committee in May of 2017. SB 103 would have banned bag bans throughout the state of Texas and nullified existing bans in places like Austin, Laguna Vista, and the tiny town of Kermit, Texas. That conservative-led effort failed, so the plastic bag bans are still upheld today. But those same lawmakers are now trying to take a different approach to achieve the same end. So time will tell whether or not they are successful in that regard. But before we dive into the deep end of that conversation, let's define a few terms. When we talk about single-use plastic bags the kind most commonly found at grocery stores and big box stores like Best Buy and Walmart, and essentially every other type of store that you might visit to buy anything, from books to prescription medicine. We're talking about a style of bag originally developed by the Swedish engineer Sten Gustaf Thulin, who in the 1960s invented a method of mass-producing plastic bags with built-in handles by producing a long tube of plastic, sealing it, at intervals, and then die-cutting holes to serve as the handles. So when you get a plastic bag to carry your groceries home from the store, the bag you're using likely makes use of a similar process. It's a long tube of plastic that is sealed to make the shape of the bag. The sealed part is the bottom of the bag that you're carrying, and a hole is then punched at the top to make the handles. A super simple concept that ended up making these bags immensely cheap and easy to produce on massive scales and it gave them a substantial carrying capacity, making them competitive with other options at the time, most of which were expensive to produce and had handles that were added separately in a secondary process, if they had handles at all, which added to their complexity and fragility. So that concept was developed in Europe, but it was a business in Georgia that brought these bags into the mainstream. The petrochemical company Mobil overturned the patent owned by Thulin's company, Celloplast, in 1977. And the Dixie Bag Company of College Park, Georgia, started distributing this style of bag, sometimes called the T-shirt style bag, because they look kind of like a shirt, though I think something may have been lost in translation there, as it really looks more like a tank top than a T-shirt in my mind. But this style of bag got its start in grocery stores as a result of the Dixie Bag Company, and really hit it big when a grocery store chain out of Cincinnati called Kroger started offering them instead of paper bags in 1982. And Kroger's main competitor, Safeway, followed suit that same year. And that was because of a deal made by the Dixie Bag Company. Now it should be mentioned that paper bags at the time did not have handles. That innovation did not hit the grocery store scene until 1990, at which point Plastic bags had had nearly a decade-long head start, and they were firmly entrenched. These plastic bags are most commonly made of polyethylene, which is a polymer made up of bajillions of ethylene monomers. Ethylene is produced via a process called steam cracking, which involves essentially superheating hydrocarbons until they break down into smaller, less dense pieces of hydrocarbon break down at the molecular level, and this process requires both petroleum and natural gas, the former to harvest for monomers, and the latter to power the process of getting those monomers and then cramming them together into a polyethylene polymer. Once the polyethylene is made, it's converted into long, thin tubes of plastic material usually through a process called blown film extrusion. I will link to a diagram and a video of this process in the show notes. To make it work, they basically blow molten polyethylene out like a balloon, so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger 
and the walls of that tube that they're making gets thinner and thinner as a result. And at the end of the process, it cools to that shape and size. And you can then take that tube and seal it at regular intervals and punch holes in it, and you've got your plastic shopping bags. So when we talk about single-use shopping bags, that's typically what's up for discussion. Some of these bags that are being made today use vegetable-based bioplastics, which is good in that they decay naturally if buried in a landfill, and in that they're not toxic. But the downside of these biodegradable bags is that if they end up at a recycling facility, they tend to break the recycling machines. They melt and they gum up the works. So it's a tricky balance, and many well-meaning people end up discarding their plastic bags in the least ideal way due to the relative lack of well-spread information on the subject and a general lack of uniformity in the types of materials used. Now, when we talk about shopping bag bans, we're usually discussing laws that make it very difficult or completely illegal for stores to use these types of single-use plastic bags. In some cases, that will mean they have to switch over completely to some alternative to the more expensive and generally less liked by consumers, paper bags, for instance. Or they might stock bags made of thicker plastic, which are meant to be used multiple times before being discarded. In the gray zone, though, there's a great deal of variety in application. In some cases, stores must charge for the bags they provide, and sometimes they're charging maybe a nickel or a quarter for one of these single-use bags. Maybe they're charging the same for a thicker plastic bag, maybe they're charging a dollar for a substantially thicker upcycled bag, while in other cases they can't provide the bags at all, and instead maybe customers are forced to carry their own reusable bags, or stores will sell reusable bags that are a little bit more expensive, but they'll sell them as products so that customers can then buy them at the checkout lane if they don't have their own. And even most complete bans on these bags are not as complete as you might think. California's plastic bag ban, for instance, was staggered so that the law impacted grocery stores first and then all other types of stores the following year. The best data that I could find for the number and type of these types of bans today, in August of 2017, comes from the National Conference of State Legislatures in a summary of recent bag-related legislature from last month. According to that data, within the U.S., only California has an official statewide ban on single-use plastic bags, and Hawaii has a kind of de facto statewide ban, as all of its most populous counties have their own county-level bans, so it adds up to essentially the same thing. The U.S. territories of American Samoa and Puerto Rico also have bans in place. Nine states have passed preemptive legislature banning the future passing of plastic bag bans. Four states currently require any store that uses bags to implement in-store labeling, recycling, or reuse programs. And the District of Columbia, that's Washington, D.C., has fees in place alongside a lighter ban on non-recyclable single-use bags. Now that's on the state level here in the U.S. On the city level, there are a few hundred cities with pending legislation on the issue, most of which are some version of a bag ban, though there are pending efforts to pass more preemptive bans on bag bans on this level as well. And then there are hundreds of other cities and counties that have already adopted bans or fees and taxes and other limitations on their own. Outside the U.S., things have been moving a little bit more rapidly, though it's also trickier to find complete data, and there are a lot of caveats about the bans that are in place elsewhere. Combining a few sources, though, it would seem that a few dozen nations around the world, from all continents except Antarctica, have put into effect either outright bans or significant financial incentives like taxes and other fees in an effort to phase out single-use plastic bags in their country. And some of these countries have been able to make a really solid go at it. In China, for instance, a ban went into effect in 2008, and although it's still today not upheld 100%, especially when it comes to smaller street vendors and other vendors that they don't regulate quite as harshly, a survey conducted in 2009 estimates that usage in the country fell somewhere between 60 and 80 percent, which for a country that size is fairly substantial. 
In other places, like Mexico, a ban has been in place since 2010, but the legislation is not observed or enforced, and single-use plastic bags reportedly remain one of the country's biggest pollution problems. Denmark, on the other hand, introduced a tax on retailers who give out such bags to their customers in 2003, and by 2014, it was estimated that the average Danish citizen used only four single-use plastic bags per year, compared to an average of 200 for most European Union citizens in other countries. So there are mixed results in that regard thus far, but change is occurring, and generally the direction of the change is away from using these types of bags rather than using more of them. Now that said, there are, as I mentioned, shopping bag ban bans being implemented around the world as well. In general, most of the shopping bag bans are being forwarded by politically left-leaning groups, and in some cases more moderate or right-leaning groups as well, those that focus their efforts on environmentalist goals. But also in general, the pushback against these bans are being funded by either right-leaning groups that favor the welfare of business over environmentalism, meaning that they think businesses and the economy can be damaged when legal decisions are made for environmental reasons that favor environmentalist ends at the expense of economic entities. And a lot of the groups and individuals opposing plastic bag bans are somewhat predictably influenced directly or indirectly by the plastic bag lobby. And yes, there is a thriving, shockingly powerful plastic bag lobby. If you search for information about plastic bag bans online, many of the top results are from a site called Bag the Ban, which is an anti-bag ban PR site run by a company called Novalex, which is an umbrella corporation that contains a family of subsidiary packaging companies, including Durobag, Bagcraft Packaging, Hylex Poly, Deluxe Packaging, General Packaging Products, International Converter, Heritage Bag, Burrow Packaging, and the umbrella company namesake, Novalex Custom Film and Bag. A few of these subsidiary companies are members of the American Progressive Bag Alliance, or APBA, which is a lobby of U.S.-based plastic bag manufacturers who spend most of their time trying to keep plastic bag bans or fees or any other anti-bag incentive or limitation from entering law around the country. For example, in 2014, the APBA spent $3 million in California organizing a petition to keep the state from banning plastic bags. That $3 million resulted in 800,000 signatures, which halted the ban until the state could have a referendum on the issue in 2016. And although the referendum was later approved under the name Proposition 67, which reinstated the ban, and that's the one mentioned in the editorial at the beginning of this episode, the $3 million invested by this lobby allowed their constituent corporations to earn somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 million for that extra year of bag sales in California. Meaning that even in situations when they're almost certain to lose in the long term, the short-term gains can be worth the substantial investments that they're making to aggressively lobby local politicians and groups and to put forth efforts like that website and like the petition. So that lobby and groups like it are shaping a lot of the discussion on one side, which makes sense really. If you make plastic bags, you would obviously fight against anything that would prevent you from selling plastic bags. It would be foolish not to. And particularly if you don't believe that banning these bags is the best way to deal with the environmental impact of your product, or if you don't believe the information being provided about that impact, as is sometimes the case, you are financially incentivized to fight this type of ban tooth and claw. Tobacco companies do the same to fight bans and fees applied to cigarettes and similar products that they produce. And we have mountains of data connecting their products to cancer and other ailments. And yet they still fight on, successfully lobbying politicians and organizations to keep their product on shelves. It makes sense then that in cases where the available data is much broader and younger 
As is the case with many facets of environmental science, especially in regards to pollution, it's easier to convince yourself, and pliable politicians, that this isn't something to be acted upon rashly and to take a firm stand on. Maybe there's something there, but why take the risk? And especially, why take the risk if that would cost you this money from this lobby? And to be perfectly frank, even if we discount much of the incredibly biased information that is being hawked by the plastic bag companies themselves and their lobby, there are still some solid arguments against these types of plastic bag bans. The politically libertarian Reason magazine published a study back in 2014 that showed some existing efforts to tax or otherwise disincentivize single-use plastic bags have, at times, increased the amount of plastic that ends up in landfills, and can also, at times, result in new societal costs that disproportionately impact the poor. And another, to me, more compelling case study comes from Austin, Texas, where their own government conducted empirical and anecdotal studies to determine the impact of a single-use plastic bag ban that they instigated in the city in 2013. The study was conducted two years after the implementation in 2015. The conclusions of this study were that the ban did an excellent job at making people feel better about the city, and it spurred a lot of secondary actions that seem similar in some ways to the broken window theory of maintaining a community, but maybe in the opposite direction. When the ban went into effect, more neighborhoods established litter pickup days, and the city as a whole became much cleaner, not just in terms of plastic bags, but in terms of all types of litter. The look and feel of Austin really seems to have improved dramatically in those two years, and there's plenty of photo evidence to support that assertion. But in terms of mitigating the environmental harm caused by single-use bags, their results were a lot fuzzier. Yes, far fewer single-use plastic bags ended up in the system, but firstly, those bags only made up 0.03% of the total landfill mass to begin with. And secondly, when they almost completely left circulation, they were replaced by a higher mass of more substantial reusable plastic bags and thicker, denser paper bags. Those paper bags were required by law to be made up of 80% or more post-consumer waste, which is good, but their construction necessitated that, in terms of waste generated by their production, each paper bag would need to have been used three to nine times to justify their being used instead of the banned single-use plastic bags. And those thicker, multi-use plastic bags were even worse, proving far more difficult to recycle when it was even possible to do so, and necessitating 4 to 12 uses before the carbon footprint for producing each bag. 4 to 12 uses before just the carbon footprint for producing each bag could be justified, again compared to the now-banned single-use plastic bags. So there are some slam-dunk aspects to bans and fees and taxes applied to single-use plastic bags in some places, but these are not holistic or universal slam-dunk measures. They do seem to create a wave of other beneficial acts and movements, provided that you think ridding cities of visible litter and instigating other environmentally friendly habits are beneficial. But the data on the back end when measuring the sheer bulk of waste in the system and the carbon cost of both creating and processing that waste, of either recycling or getting rid of it in some other way, is a little more muddled, and in some cases even falls more squarely in favor of those single-use plastic bags, according to some metrics, at least. And that brings us to another broader topic that I think is kind of a seldom-addressed foundation of this discussion, and that is the issue of how we design products from the very beginning. In a sense, we design things to be used and then discarded, but very few producers of things, of anything, take what happens when their product is disposed of into consideration as they are designing that product. Yes, we know from data that you will use the average plastic bag for 20 minutes before you discard it. That is the lifespan of that plastic bag. But without some kind of system on the back end for handling that bag when it's discarded, 
the typical polyethylene bag will sit in a landfill for 1,000 years or end up in the ocean somewhere, slowly eroding into tiny bits of plastic that end up in the guts of fish and whales. And that, I think, it's probably safe to say, is not ideal for anyone. But there are products and there are designers that take a more hands-on approach to this at the very beginning, when they are first concocting, when they're first inventing and designing and developing their product. People who take the entire life cycle of a product into consideration, very much including its death and disposal and potentially its afterlife. There's a term in manufacturing, design for the environment, that says essentially producers of physical goods should ensure that the processing, manufacturing, packaging, and disposal, or reuse, are all aligned with their society's values. The implication being that anyone who makes anything should keep these concerns in mind, in addition to things like how well the product functions, whether or not it's attractive, and all the other attributes we've always kept in mind when designing a new product. Now, to accomplish this, creators of things will generally undertake what's called a life cycle assessment, which is a process of investigation that helps producers forecast what kinds of long-term outcomes might result from their product. A successful life cycle forecast for cigarettes, for example, might have helped predict the immense amount of damage that product caused to people in the shape of cancer and other health issues, in addition to warning that city streets and sidewalks around the world might become littered with cigarette butts, as the locations where people chose to smoke wouldn't necessarily always have easily accessible trash cans. Such an assessment might also have predicted the periodic wildfires that are started by people who are smoking in a dry, combustible region and who then discard their still smoldering cigarette butt into flammable grasses or bushes. Now that example also shows the difficulty of this type of assessment. There was preliminary science back in the day that indicated there might be health issues with cigarettes, but it would have been difficult to predict things like the secondary problem of having a city's sidewalks cluttered with cigarette butts, and perhaps even more difficult to predict the increase in wildfires due to the confluence of smoking and the shift in global weather patterns. But that said, there is still much that can be predicted, and which generally isn't, due to, first, the desire of companies making these products not to have these consequences stand between them and making their product available, and second, the extra cost involved in conducting a proper cradle-to-grave assessment of one's actions. This is not to imply that this type of system can't work, though, especially for facets of our economy that are producing more than the typical amount of waste. Committing to a thorough design for the environment plan, informed by a well-funded life cycle assessment, could do a lot of good on a lot of levels. For instance, you might discover that a lot of the damage done by the plastic bags you want to bring to market could be alleviated by creating a bag that could be composted after use. This would require choosing the proper construction material, the proper inks used on the bag, the proper shape for the bag to ensure that it doesn't travel very far when blown around by the wind, and that it doesn't hurt animals or contaminate the soil or the ocean as it breaks down. And doing that up front would allow the creators of this bag to make choices from the outset that would ensure the finished product is ideal, or at least as ideal as possible given the data that we have, from its birth until its death. And it would allow them to reimagine everything about the bag from the get-go, maybe making it a box instead, or some other shape, or even some kind of device or system that they could use instead of a bag as opposed to just making a new type of bag that is essentially the same except for the type of materials used in its construction, which is the only option that you really have after the fact once you've already created a niche for that particular product. Now the tricky part, of course, is convincing plastic bag manufacturers that exist to make plastic bags that they might want to make something other than plastic bags. And the result of that difficulty is the preponderance of plastic bag bans, which are trying to incentivize them to make those changes, and the ban on plastic bag bans, which is the preemptive counterattack of these plastic bag manufacturers to avoid having to make any changes. 
But despite their pushback, it does seem that some kind of incentive to nudge them in this direction is probably warranted, as the consequences of not handling these types of things from the beginning is well, basically what we have today, pretty much everywhere. We have a lot of different ideas about how to try to keep these bags from polluting our environment, about how to recycle and otherwise dispose of them effectively, about how to keep them from becoming an even bigger issue than they already are, from the local level, littering our streets to the global level, finding their way into our oceans en masse, and breaking down into little bits that eventually decimate entire aquatic ecosystems. And all of these solutions that we have today are wildly imperfect. In some cases, the recycling produces more carbon than it prevents. In some cases, the costs are just sky high. And in some cases, these solutions simply don't work, or they fail to address the core issue, which is, unfortunately, that these bags are very good at one thing, being filled with groceries or some other type of consumable and helping you carry those groceries home. But they suck horribly at essentially everything else in every other way, by every other metric. They are tragically bad. And what we probably need are more standards for what everything else means in this context. Design for the environment and life cycle assessment researchers get us part of the way there. But unfortunately, these methods haven't been tested on scale. And it's incredibly unlikely that the companies responsible for producing the majority of waste in the world will independently decide to apply these sorts of standards to themselves, along with all the costs associated with that type of move. The incentives currently on the table are just not the kinds that are appealing to corporate entities, aside from the legal incentives at least, the bans and such, which is why that's what we're kind of stuck with right now in terms of solutions. But thankfully, that's not a universal thing. Not all corporations are entirely tone deaf in this area. Something that I like about the retail giant IKEA is how it brings some of this ideology, the sustainability ideology, to its shelves, and it does so independently without being forced to by any government entity. I appreciate IKEA for their design sensibility in terms of aesthetics and in terms of the clever ways that they allow customers to save money on products by ensuring that they are produced and shipped and packaged in certain ways. A lot of what they sell decreases in price over time because they figure out an interesting way to replace one extraneous part that was expensive to source or realized that they could ship a particular table in a different Tetris-like arrangement, allowing them to pack more units into every shipping crate. But something that they aren't as public about is their commitment to sustainable production methods and the guiding principles behind a lot of the sourcing, production, shipping, and even product design decisions that they make. If you dig deep enough into their website, you can find their sustainability reports and their vast list of environmental commitments and tactics that they used to achieve those commitments. But they don't bank on them the way that other companies like Patagonia might. Part of this is that Patagonia is an outdoorsy brand, and therefore their deep-seated environmental commitments make sense on the branding level. But another component of this is that IKEA's aims seem to be more about making certain sustainability opportunities common rather than niche. They don't want to appeal to just the existing environmentalists. They want to allow essentially every person, even people who think that such things are hokum, to play a role in making that type of positive, sustainable changeover. Even without having to consciously make that decision, they can still play a role in it. For example, IKEA decided early on to stop selling incandescent light bulbs, completely switching over their entire line to the vastly more energy efficient, but at the time more expensive, LED bulbs. These new types of bulbs are way more common today, but at the time, about a decade ago, the changeover was still kind of an early adopter sort of thing, and those types of bulbs were substantially more expensive than their more common, old-fashioned counterparts. But IKEA is one of the most trafficked purveyors of stuff in the world. 783 million people visited their stores in 2016. Their physical stores, and 2.1 billion visited their website. Those types of numbers mean they have the ability to greatly benefit from economies of scale, with everything getting cheaper as they order huge shipments and figure out clever ways to reduce the costs on those products. Now, they, of course, were not single-handedly responsible 
for speeding up the widespread adoption of energy-efficient bulbs, but they were a not insignificant factor in that changeover. In 2016 alone, they sold 79 million LED light bulbs. Imagine that same scale applying to everything, and imagine that the company wielding that type of power over what sells and what doesn't, what becomes mainstream and accessible and what doesn't, is a company that has made commitments to sustainability that have not been government mandated and that isn't a huge part of their marketing materials. That, to me, is pretty rad. Now, all that said, this is not an IKEA commercial. I think they do a great job and I appreciate the way that they more often than not beneficently throw their weight around when it comes to this type of thing. But it could be argued that they are still very much part of the larger problem. And because of their size, they are, in fact, a huge part of that larger problem. Yes, they sold 79 million LED bulbs in 2016, which is a far cry better than selling 79 million incandescent bulbs, which have 1 20th the lifespan of LEDs and use six times as much energy to produce the same amount of light. But did consumers really need to purchase nearly 80 million new light bulbs last year? Is it possible that a decent-sized chunk of those purchases were not folks replacing their old energy-wasting light bulbs with new energy-efficient bulbs, but rather people buying lamps they don't really need to fill up spaces in their home that they feel compelled to fill with stuff because of marketing materials from companies like IKEA? It's possible. IKEA would not have the leverage that it has over so many different industries if they did not sell a whole lot of stuff. And that means they have to keep all that stuff flying off the shelves, and they have to keep pumping out new products to provide new reasons for customers to buy more stuff year after year. They need to convince you to replace that old lamp that you got last year, this year, with a new lamp. Otherwise, they lose the benefits of scale because they don't sell enough to wield the proper amount of economic influence. In those same reports that they have on their website, it says that IKEA currently has 9,500 products available across their entire range, and that each year they release 2,500 new products to keep things fresh. It is admirable that they try to make consumption less costly in terms of their consumers' wallets and in terms of the ecological footprint of those products. But might it not be even less costly, in both cases, by both metrics, for people to feel compelled to buy less and then to actually, you know, buy less as a result of that? And this, again, is where a lot of the current solutions or proposed solutions to ecological issues created by our consumption-driven economy fall apart. Because in many cases, the option that no one can afford to take seriously is a structural revisitation or even a structural overhaul of what our consumer landscape looks like, how we might rebuild it completely from the ground up. We have a lot of solutions that involve coping with all the plastic bags after they're already made, or replacing them with other plastic bag-shaped objects, but we have far fewer proposed solutions that ask if we should be using those bags to begin with. Why not come up with other ways to get objects from point A to point B? Why not reimagine the way in which we package things, or the way in which we shop? Why don't we use solar-powered drones, or wind-powered pneumatic tubes? to get our groceries from the store to our homes? Why don't we push for technologies that allow us to print more of the things that we buy ourselves at home instead of having to ship and carry them all over the place to begin with? A lot of the solutions to this type of problem are theoretical right now, but they are theories that warrant discussion. If we never talk about the possibility of a bag-free world or a traditional shopping-free world, of maybe completely reimagining that entire experience of the way that we exchange value, then we can't know what a radical shakeup might accomplish. Even if it seems unthinkable right now to have a world without shopping bags or without IKEA, or at least IKEA as we think of it today, asking what such a world might look like can be informative when coming up with outside the box or outside the bag concepts that could help us tackle these issues at the source before they become issues. 
it might help us to come up with more solutions that address the actual root problems that we've come to take for granted rather than doing what we usually do and simply addressing the symptoms of these problems. One potential approach to solving many of our consumer catalyzed problems is to take the reusable shopping bag concept and elevate it to a whole new level, which is to say, why don't we just make more of our products last forever? Why not ditch the single-use bags and the supposedly multi-use bags that are still cheap enough that we feel comfortable throwing them away after a few uses, and instead focus on making bags that could conceivably last for decades, bags meant to stand up to the frictions of time and of frequent use? These bags would need to be more expensive, which is one hurdle to their adoption. And assuming that you only have one or two of such bags, you may find yourself lacking suitable bag real estate on larger scale grocery shopping expeditions. But this is a concept that still has merit, I think, and it could be utilized even outside the realm of shopping bags. Why not infinite use everything? Why not cars that run forever? Light bulbs that never need replacing? Clothing that will not just last a very long time, but which can be repaired if they're damaged even, making them potentially everlasting. Infinite pants, forever shirts, immortal shoes. Why don't we just make those? And I don't think I'm the only person asking this question. This is a concept that seems to be gaining in popularity, in some spaces at least. Many companies that make leather goods like belts and wallets, have for a very long time promoted their products as possessions that get better with age. A company called Flint and Tinder makes what they call a 10-year hoodie, which they originally funded on Kickstarter with the tagline, built for life and backed for a decade. There's nothing particularly special about this hoodie to differentiate it from other high-end hoodies. It sells for about 100 bucks, so most of the hoodies in that price range are at least decently well-made. But this one doubles down on doing the stitching right and reinforcing problem areas and using high-end zippers and other components. And the company backs the hoodie with a service guarantee. So if something breaks or needs mending, they'll fix it. And that guarantee holds for 10 years. I've seen this same marketing message used a lot recently with other goods that, like leather goods, are not new, but which are finding new life, particularly with younger consumers. Cast iron pots and pans, for instance, are experiencing kind of a resurgence, as are raw denim jeans with selvage stitching, which are two approaches to making jeans that went out of vogue in the early 1900s, but which have taken on new life in the last few years as a counter move to the dominant clothing business trend of fast fashion, where clothing is made to be essentially disposable which encourages the constant refreshing of your wardrobe. And all that refreshing, I should note, happens without any consideration for the end life of the garments in question. So the fast fashion trend creates a massive amount of waste each year. And these traditional ways of making jeans, among other clothes, seem to be a reaction to that as much as anything else. So these products, and many others that are coming back into the mainstream, present options that focus on Durability, reparability, and at least the implication of continued relevance and utility. Durability is how well the products stand up to the test of time. And in some cases, that just means they can take a lot of hard knocks before dying. In other cases, as with the innards of electric cars, which I discussed in more depth in last week's episode of the show, they just last a hell of a long time because they are simpler and have far fewer moving parts and other points of failure compared to their internal combustion engine kin. In other cases, the durability is partially dependent on something very akin to wabi-sabi, which is the Japanese concept of valuing an object for its temporality and imperfection. Appreciating a well-worn journal, made out of leather, for instance, is an appreciation predicated on wabi-sabi, because chances are you love that journal, at least in part, for all of its scars and stains and tears. So goods made of cast iron and leather and hardwoods and thick denim tend to get better with age according to that standard, making them durable in the sense that they're still useful as they become worn, rather than in the sense that they 
avoid becoming worn at all, as might be the case with objects made of certain types of synthetic plastics or rubber. Reparability means you can mend something that breaks. Many modern electronics trade reparability for reduced size or increased functionality. iPhones and similar gadgets, for instance, usually get very low scores in this regard because the companies that make them make the decision to opt for better aesthetics and functionality over building something that the end user can easily take apart and repair or upgrade on their own. Though it is worth noting that many iPhones can be repaired just not by the owner of the device, which is different from being able to take apart and repair and upgrade your own PC, for example. But it's still better than having no repair capabilities at all. It might cost you something to do it, but it's possible to get more life out of such a device compared to one that is worthless as soon as the smallest piece breaks or wears out. Perhaps the most difficult of these three elements to consistently provide is the guarantee of continued relevancy and utility. How can you guarantee that people will still wear hoodies in 10 years? I mean, you could guess that they probably will, someone will, but who's to say? Maybe in 10 years, hoodies, because of some crazy event, will have come to be associated with space Nazis or something. And everyone who invested in the 10-year hoodie will come to regret their purchase, not because the hoodie as an object has worn out and ceased to be useful in that way, but because culturally, because of that association, no sane person would wear one. This is the case with many electronics as well. One of the main arguments coming from technology companies like Apple, when they don't make their products easy to repair at home, is essentially that by the time the average device they sell wears out to the point where it needs repair, there's already a vastly superior product on the market. So you might as well just get that. There was a time when I personally would swap out the components of my PC every couple of years, upgrading the RAM and the hard drive and other stuff with newer, better models. And you can still do that today with some devices, but some components evolve so quickly that although you could conceivably continue to swap out pieces of your original PC, ship of Theseus style, At a certain point, you'll be adding very high-end pieces to a low-end foundation that simply can't keep up. It becomes a bottleneck. You could keep repairing and upgrading, but it would cost less in many cases to simply buy a brand new device. And this constant evolution is, on the whole, I would argue, a good thing for society. But in terms of how it plays and interacts with our consumer economy, This predilection is a bit like fuel on the flames of our already smoldering desire to keep buying stuff. Now, I'm willing to bet that some computer company could make an infinitely upgradable personal computer, but what happens when we all move to some other platform? What happens when laptops become more compelling than the immortal desktop computer that you bought? And then again, what happens when smartphones replace laptops? And then again, when Whatever comes after smartphones, what happens when that becomes the norm? It's neat that you have an everlasting PC, but of what use is it at that point, even if it is still fully functional? Infinite utility, then, is difficult to achieve for multiple different reasons. And even if it's possible to achieve in some limited way, in many cases the benefits of having such a product pale in comparison to the benefits of replacing your old whatever with a new shiny whatever. The incentives baked into our system would make sure of that, even if cultural evolution did not. So how valuable is a hoodie that can last for 10 years, but which you will only wear for two? If 10 years worth of materials and effort and expenditure go into that hoodie, isn't that actually worsening a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve? If every single person who buys one doesn't get at least 10 years out of that garment, At what point are these immortal, or nearly immortal, objects more damaging than their temporal short-term equivalents? Right now, our economic model is dependent on a certain regularity of consumption. This trait is called the purchase frequency of products, but it's sometimes measured as the repeat purchase rate. What this means is that 3M, the corporation that owns Scotchbrite, knows that consumers will replace their sponge every so often, let's say every week or so. That means they have the chance to sell a four-pack of sponges from their Scotch-Brite brand to consumers about once a month. 
And if they do the math, taking into account how many potential customers they can reach with their marketing materials, they can come up with a pretty solid estimate as to how many sponges a typical customer acquired for a certain price via those marketing materials will purchase from them in an average year. And that's how things work in most industries, although the math is different in every case. You buy a car far less than you buy sponges, and the amount of money invested is also substantially higher. But the same math is done, and the incentives are lined up in such a way that producers of any type of good succeed if they can compel you to buy more things more often. But what happens if a really high-quality, everlasting sponge were to come along? What if this sponge were not just super long-lasting, but also super effective, if it compared favorably with every other sponge currently on the market? How much would a company need to charge for that everlasting sponge to make the math work for them under today's economic model? I'm guessing that price would need to be seriously high, and I'm guessing, too, that they would feel the need to supplement it with an array of different services, perhaps a subscription services through which you're able to get soap to go with your sponge and maybe a sponge cleaning service that would be conducted at regular intervals. In other words, most businesses are set up to have regular, predictable incomes. They are not set up to make just enough sponges for every person who is ever likely to buy a sponge from them and then stop. Businesses don't stop. And so it's a difficult thing to even imagine. What if a company that makes these forever sponges that never wear out and that you'll never need to replace comes into being and successfully sells a sponge to everyone. Every person on the planet has one of these sponges and this company has made as much money as they will ever make from that perfect product. What's next? What do they do? There's another term that I think is quite relevant to this discussion and that term is planned obsolescence. And I should note that this term gets thrown around a lot in a lot of cases where it actually isn't directly relevant, where people are just pissed that new features on the devices that they're buying are staggered in terms of when they're released, and so they call it planned obsolescence, but that's actually not always the case. But in this case, if this company made a sponge that truly would last forever, but then built into that sponge a death clock that would cause the sponge to stop working after, let's say, three years, that would be planned obsolescence. It's essentially building flaws of some kind into your product to ensure that you'll have a steady flow of customers in the future, ensuring that your products will eventually be made obsolete by some new product that you will release, which in turn ensures you never run out of people to sell to. A company that sells one sponge to every person and then disappears, their work completed, isn't a company that would be likely to be able to exist within today's business ecosystem. It's not how such things are done, and we don't even have funding or organizational models that would make something like that feasible on scale. So all that said, I want to end this episode with a few questions that I think are worth thinking about when it comes to the topic of what we make, how we make, and how we might become better makers in the future. First, what might our business environment look like if we did allow the immortal sponge company to become a thing? How would you promote it? How would you fund it? How would you justify putting all the other sponge companies out of business? And would the trade-offs, like the wholesale destruction of the sponge industry, be worth bequeathing unlimited sponging to every person on the planet? Would the knowledge that we don't need to create any more sponges and the associated decrease in sponge-making waste make up for the fact that now a bunch of people are out of work and entire fortunes have collapsed as a result of killing off that stream of continuous sponge purchasing income that was flowing into all those coffers. Second, where is the proper balance point between building things that are as durable, reparable, and continuously useful as possible, and those that are intentionally temporal meant to last only a few years, if that? And how might we alleviate the downsides of both? The resource intensity of the former, along with the potential that they won't actually be used as long as they can last, and the waste created by the latter. And might there be a way to blend the two, creating more things that are built to last a short time, 
but which can be upcycled in different ways. Might we be able to create infinite cycles and systems that are made up of closed loops instead of making individual products that are meant to be infinite? Third, how might we change these systems if we ever do decide that we need to? If, for instance, a 3D printer that could generate absolutely anything perfectly in our homes, from food to medicine to furniture, were to be invented, how would we prevent those who depend on the current consumer system from killing that new technology in its crib? How would we switch over to a new, superior, presumably, at-home printing-based system knowing that in doing so, no matter how carefully we do it, we will likely completely end a million different norms and traditions, not to mention jobs, that were created over the course of thousands of years by generations of human societies around the world. And finally, how best to ensure that necessary changes to these systems as they evolve occur? Do we rely on government mandate? or economic incentives? Do we use social pressures and popular movements? Maybe we stick to straight-up economic competition? And thinking in the opposite direction, how to best maintain positive existing norms of this kind in the face of new possibilities that emerge that might be good by some metrics but which are horrible by other metrics? How do we keep those from replacing our existing positive norms? Like a lot of questions that I ask on this show, there are not any easy answers here, but I think it's important to start asking these types of questions now. So on that fine day, when someone finally does fulfill the promise of humanity and invents an everlasting sponge, we will know what to do. We will be prepared. If you are enjoying this show, consider leaving a quick review up on iTunes. That helps a whole lot more than you'd think, and it takes a fraction of a minute to do it. You might also consider sharing the show with a friend, which is a great way to help spread the word, and it's one of the top ways that this show is spread. People who appreciate such things share it with other people who they think might also appreciate such things, and I love that. That's exactly how I want this thing to keep growing. And you can also become a patron on Patreon if you go to patreon.com slash LKT. And another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors. The first sponsor today is Everlane. If you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, you will be taken to the Everlane website, and they will pay out a finder's fee, essentially a commission for anything that you buy. So it's a great way to kill two birds with one stone if you have something in mind that you are needing, a gap in your wardrobe that needs filling, if you need a new bag for some purpose, they have excellent bags. Don't buy anything just to buy things. I definitely do not encourage that. But if you do already have something in mind, they are a wonderful option. I really appreciate them as a company, and I appreciate the products that they make as well. Let's note things.com slash Everlane. And the other sponsor today is HostGator, another company that I very much appreciate on multiple levels. Whether you're starting a blog or a portfolio or some substantially bigger online endeavor, they have hosting options for you. And their options are already very reasonably priced, but if you go to hostgator.com LKT, you will receive a substantial discount off of those prices. And getting your hosting through them through that link is also another great way to help the show. Hostgator.com slash LKT. Now at this point in the show, I usually recommend a book, but today I want to recommend something else that is similar to a book, similar to an audiobook in some ways, but it's also not partially in the sense that it is free and partially in the sense that it is a podcast. So all of you already have the means of getting it without having to part with any money, though if you enjoy it, I I recommend contributing to the, the host and his show. But the show that I want to recommend is Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. And the reason that this show came to mind today is that just the other day, he dropped a new episode called The Celtic Holocaust. And this is really meaningful when he does this. He has a huge backlog of old episodes. But the thing about hardcore history is that each episode is immense. And this new episode that he just released is six hours long. And for anyone who hasn't heard this show before, hasn't heard anything about it, he's essentially the most compelling and dynamic and enthusiastic history teacher ever. 
he's not a history teacher, but he is a history nerd. And the way that he tells these stories is just so fascinating and so memorable that the episode is six hours long, but you'll work your way through it without even realizing how quickly you did so. The time will just fly by. Probably my favorite series of episodes from his archive of this show is called Blueprint for Armageddon, which is about World War I. And there are six in that series, and they're about four hours apiece. So he really does put a whole lot of time and effort into every single one of these shows. Each one is like a, a small audiobook. But again, they're also free, and you can find them through your podcasting app of choice, whatever you're listening to this show on, if it sounds interesting. Dan Carlin has another show called Common Sense as well, which is more of a current events and political commentary type of show, which is excellent as well. He's a kind of a centrist politically, which means he's equally good at ragging on both extremes politically. But if you've had enough of politics for right now, and I would not fault you if that is the case, indulging in a little bit of history is a great way to continue to build up your contextual understanding of the world and what's happening today without having to sit and get twitchy about the notifications from the news app on your phone. So I highly recommend checking out Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoy it, consider contributing to it. I personally think it's worthwhile. It's one of my favorite podcasts. I hope you enjoy it. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at xllifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of Let's Know Things at letsknowthings.com. Feel free to reach out on the social networks. My name is at Colin is my name everywhere but Facebook where I'm just Colin Wright. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. <laughs>